I think that's a go. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's jam session, uh, where we'll hear how the world's top artists, music makers, and brands are using out of home to reach the top of the charts and influence pop culture. Uh, from client partnerships uh, to first ever ways to connect with fans through social media content, learn how your favorite brands and artists are increasingly innovating and using out of home to huge success. Um, so today we have a very exciting uh, session to talk about just that. Um, and that, you know, everything we learn here can of course also be, you know, imported to and applied to other types of media because the music industry is really inspirational when it comes to out of home. Um, uh, so with me here today, I have three powerhouses from three sides of the business. Uh, starting with uh, uh, Jennifer Fromer, uh, who is SVP of Culture and Creative Partnerships for Columbia Records and Sony Music and a very good friend of mine. So great to have you here, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. Uh, and then we have Ian Dallimore, uh, who is VP of Digital Growth and Programmatic at Lamar Advertising. Uh, he is also the host of the Digital and Dirt podcast, which is an excellent one. So once you're done uh, listening to our webinar here today, I really uh, encourage you to tune into that one. Uh, and then, uh, so welcome, Ian. Um, and then also with us, we have Sam K. Wanfar, who's the CEO and founder of Milk Money, uh, which is an out of home uh, media buying platform and uh, true uh, Hollywood guy, uh, friend of the stars and expert at all of the topics we're going to talk about here today. So welcome uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, let's kick off what I think is going to be a really great conversation. Um, so diving right in, um, starting with you, Jennifer. Um, Musicians today are much more than singers, songwriters, and performers or performers. They're much more. They're now expected to be global culture makers. They're influencing the masses. And you know they have to be very savvy marketers themselves. Sometimes they have more of a product than, than just the music. Um, so I want to kick it off by asking you to tell us a little bit about working with Lil Nas X. Uh, who's, who's one of your clients um, and how he's emerged over the years, uh, over your years with him as a, you know, as, as a client to be a, a true master marketer. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about that, Jen? Absolutely. I have been working with and partnering with Lil Nas X since, since the very, very beginning. Um, what, what was so genius about him, even, you know, when, when he first got started was, um, he wrote the beats and the lyrics for Old Town Road while sitting on his sister's couch in Georgia and Atlanta. He found some beats for the song in like Scandinavia or something like scouring the internet and finding beats and putting the song together like a real Frankenstein. Um, he then, once he had this, the song ready, he then created a uh, music video out of it from scenes from old video games. And so he was completely, you know, manipulating culture by taking things that Gen Z looks at on a daily basis, video games, beats from around the world, et cetera, put Old Town Road up and was the first artist to ever truly mashed together trap and country. So from the get go this, and then of course, as we all know, TikTok played, before TikTok was really TikTok, he was sort of a pioneer in the TikTok space. He took this video that he created um, with you know beats from here, video clips from there, created TikToks of it and the track just caught fire um, by way of TikTok. Um, and then because the song, you know, as I mentioned, was the first iteration of a mashup of trap and country, it fueled all sorts of controversy, which he just added fuel to the fire by continuing to um, you know, be the first uh, black gay rapper to intersect country with trap. And then the song took off because of not only the controversy, but the way in which he engineered the track and put it together. So, you know, even hearkening back to the very, 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 very first thing he ever did in culture, it was really understanding how to manipulate utilizing social media um, content and figuring out ways to reach the masses kind of just by sitting on his couch, which is, you know, kind mm -hmm. of, you know, and this is, this has happened three years ago and we've, now it sounds sort of commonplace, but I, I would argue that he was the very first person to do something like this. It's quite genius. Uh, that's super cool. I think we may have some imagery, uh, both of Lil Nas X, for those of you who might not know him, and then also, uh, I want to hear a little bit more on, like, Genius Thinks He's Done. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about his use of fake billboards in his Montero lunch? 
Absolutely. So what we're looking at here is really is is art imitating art, imitating life, and imitating art. Last year, he to, to the, the sort of like the preview into Montero, which is one of the biggest albums of the year. Um, let's go back to the previous one for Holiday. He created uh, little Santa Nas X. So he created a, he wanted to kind of get away from Old Town Road, get away from the country work that he had done previously and start to migrate into like a uber fashion star, which he totally is now, as we all know. So uh, little, little Santa, Santa Nas X then is like his persona that he took on being Lil Nas X in this, as a silver Santa. He's then in front of himself. This was actually shot from what's so great about this is it's a, it's a, it's a still from a video shoot of him playing a new character of Santa for his track holiday in front of a billboard that's kind of like a fake billboard that he put together just for the launch of, of uh, holiday. Now we can go to the next slide, which later on this year with the launch of the Montero album, the full length album, the, the billboards that we're gonna see in a moment are, yeah, are, you know, him kind of taking a swab at, at everybody who was making fun of him, uh, who picked on him for being gay and, you know, his diversity. And he did these really incredible billboards, all came from his brain as to just kind of manipulate the masses and tongue in cheek, everything he does, as he does so well, which continues to raise awareness for not only himself, but his music and his album. Super cool and su super engaging. And I think not, well, we can get into that a little later, but I think you you did that by Sam, right? We did both of those buys, yeah. And Very. He, he, he also hand selected his own billboards. So to Jennifer's point, he's, he's very hands-on uh, and he was very selective about where he picked his boards. The first one for holiday, it's actually on Sunset Boulevard, but it was, it was hand-picked in front of a parking lot so that he could actually spend some time doing a TikTok video in front of it. So it was very well thought out in, in his approach as well. well super, and super. These ones were on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So he wanted them to, you know, be where, you know, there's a, a tourist trap, if you will, right? So he wanted a lot of people to take pictures as they're walking through the Walk of Fame. Well, I mean, really, really creative guy, but also clearly a someone who likes out of home and gets gets the power yes. of it. That's very encouraging for us. Um, um, but it's not just about Linus X. Um, Ian, um, our favorite brands and artists are, you know, increasingly using, it's not just him, you know, they're using out of home to market music to new heights. What's mm -hmm. the biggest change that you've seen? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. We, we've seen this evolution happen in the, in the uh, entertainment business, specifically movies, where it was always Times Square and Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood Walk of Fame. And over the years, what we've seen in the evolution on the movie side is now happening in the music side of business is they're still buying these iconic locations on Sunset in LA, in New York, Times Square, high trafficked areas. And I enjoy seeing the social aspect of it to where they can take a photo. But you know, as our medium has emerged in ingesting more real-time data, what we're finding is companies like Sony, like Columbia Pictures, and so many other music companies that represent these artists, they're taking first party data, you know, just as action films are overlaying across the US and saying, okay, where's the highest index towards that specific audience? They're doing the same thing. So, you know, cases like ACDC's uh, comeback album that came out, they did just that. They said, okay, let's overlay, overlay this type of audience across the US. And so we're beginning to see them be, become more sophisticated like they do in the online space and now spilling over to out of home, which I find it's the perfect synergy is using iconic locations and then peppering in that audience driven data uh, mm -hmm. buys that exist today. So that, I, I think again, that benefits our, our space tremendously and it helps the artists promote their album truly beyond you know, just a, a social media snapshot. Yeah, that for sure. Uh, and, you know, again, the connection between the real world and the, the virtual world in a sense, right? Yep. Um, Sam, um, so, I mean, you you work with a lot of artists um, and have done, you know, basically throughout throughout your career. When you get involved with an artist campaign to, la to launch or a new release, what's, what's the number one thing that they're usually hoping to get out of out of home? Well, originally, <clears throat> to Ian's point, uh, it was vanity. Right, they want it to be in high profile, high visible, high traffic areas. But now it's how do they connect with their fans? 
how can they engage their fans and also generate some user content? Um, so the integration between social media and the IRL experience of, of out of home has really started to become synergistic. So it's, it's really important, like to, to Ian's point also, location specific boards outside of Times Square and Sunset have become really, really important. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of artists that are buying billboards in their hometown to kind of show like their, their friends and family that they made it or they're buying it where, you know, an ex-girlfriend or someone lives, right? So it's that, that, that point of like, look, like, you know, I've, I've broken out of the small town and I've, I've made it big time. But then you also have um, artists that want to gamify their billboards and utilize like QR codes or augmented reality um, to be able to get fans to discover these and kind of gamify the experience, which has been really, really exciting. So I think we have a few examples here that do you want to talk to those, uh, Sam? I think we have yeah. Travis Scott, Miley, and Fenty, the Fenty uh, mirror wall slide. Yeah, so I think the amazing thing that we've experienced over the last couple of years is that outdoor advertising has really evolved beyond just the traditional bulletin. Um, and it's engaging uh, a little bit more of the experiential and non-traditional side of out of home. To me, it's all, it's all exciting because it, it achieves the same, same goal, right? So rather than just being on a billboard, in this case, we deployed hundreds of drones in the sky and we did a, a drone QR code above uh, the Rolling Loud Music Festival where Travis Scott was able to release new music via the QR code in the sky. And what was really amazing is that not only did that QR code unlock new music on Spotify, but it, it also translated to uh, the press. So Variety and Rolling Stone and a bunch of other publications picked it up and the QR code actually worked on the image. So all of that was earned, uh, earned impressions and earned media value. So not only did all the fans at the festival get to unlock new music, but anybody who read the articles that had photographs of the QR code in the sky also got to uh, discover the music, which was pretty fascinating. It's super cool. And then I think we have another example. Uh, yeah, this one, the Miley one. This one, this was, well, now also a, a, a Columbia artist, um, but Miley uh, in, this, in this case had uh, the idea of having a phone number where her fans could basically call the number and discover the album, the EP. Uh, and when you call the phone number, she basically had a track list of all the music on her album and you could, you know, click one, two, three, four, whatever it was to discover different tracks on the album. And the beautiful thing for her was she got to capture all of that data and all the content and have the phone numbers of all her fans so that she could retarget them and basically know who her most loyal fans were. And anytime she had a tour, she had merch drops, new music. Uh, she had a direct plug in to all of our artists. So the, the remarkable thing about this campaign was Miley picked all of these assets herself. She was very specific about where she wanted to book them. She booked them all herself on her tour bus when she was in Europe. Um, and we generated over 1 million phone calls and text messages in a week. So that's really like the power of out of home. Super, super cool. I think we're just quickly going to show one more example and then I want to want to move on. Uh, we have a lot to cover here, but this is a Fenty one, right? This was amazing. So during Fashion Week, um, Rihanna had just launched and announced her, her, her Fenty line of clothing with LVMH um, and wanted to make sure she had something on the ground during uh, Fashion Week in Soho. So we created this custom um, selfie mirror wall in Soho that basically was, was up throughout the, the duration of uh, Fashion Week. And she tweeted this out. And all of a sudden, all of her fans poured, uh, poured to the streets and lined up to take selfies in front of this mirror and, and generated hundreds of millions of impressions in a matter of a couple of days, uh, which was fantastic for the launch of the brand. As you can see, it says Fenty.com. So it just drove everybody straight to the website and, and created firsthand user content uh, that they engaged on online. 
that's 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 really great and also a nice segue into the to the next section here where I really want to talk about the brand or art and its partnerships and collabs. So Jen, uh, what is the connection between marketers and music and between brands and artists and why why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's increasingly getting harder and harder to cut through the clutter, to cut through culture, to make an impact, you know, with the advent of, you know, there being no one one place where people can watch anything. It's so fragmented. And I think brands, the reason why brands align with music artists more so than probably any other category of talent is because an artist lives in multiple spaces. An artist can be a, uh, you know, they're, they're obviously a singer, they've got content, they've got music videos, they've got um, concerts, you know, there's no shortage of, of, of slots, if you will, that you can fill into as a brand. And beyond that, the fan bases of, of, of music artists are larger than, than you, if you were to play a game, which we sometimes do, look at, you know, an artist's Instagram versus an actor's Instagram. I mean, it blows, it blows away, you know, just a regular celebrity. And I would even argue a pesky old influencer, unless you're talking about the Kardashians. But, um, you know, for the most part, artists have much, much, much more uh, touch points, visibility, and ways to break through. Beyond the audiences, um, there's a lot of authenticity and there's, you know, you can move them. You've heard of, all, you know, the, uh, the Beehive, the BTS armies. There's ways that fans move on behalf of a brand once the artist is engaged to that particular brand. What I see a lot of more so, you know, we have conversations like this a lot. Um, artists will not, oh, somebody sold out, that one sold out. No, there's no such thing as selling out because especially with these younger artists, they're not gonna do something if they don't believe in the brand. It's just, a, it's a non-starter. Put a brand in front of an artist, even if it's, you know, a lot of money that they couldn't get. If they're not into it, they're not going to do it. And you know what? Ultimately, it'll break down anyway. So it has to come from a place of authenticity, a place where the artist really understands the brand and enjoys the brand, uses the brand, or if they don't, believes in what the brand can do. Um, the example that you're seeing here with Uber Eats and Sir Elton John, first of all, with Lil Nas X, Nas, you know, how it, all, it was very um, uh, symbiotic because Elton John actually had a track on Nas's latest album, Montero. So they were already working together, which is why we decided to put them together in the first place. And what's so cool about this image that you're looking at here is they're wearing each other's costumes, if you didn't know that. So Nas is in one of Elton's iconic costumes and vice versa. And so, you know, really layered into the way that these two talent work together, um, how Uber Eats is something, what's so brilliant about this campaign is that Uber Eats is the most sort of like accessible uh, everyday man sort of thing to order. Yet look at these two, you know, crazy, flamboyant, incredibly uh, artistic men that are enjoying Uber Eats just like everybody else. So that's why it works is because it leans into the storytelling. Uh, it's super, super cool. I think, Ian, you have a you have a good example, too, right? Yeah, for sure. Um so you, you talk about authenticity and there's no one that speaks to the country music world, middle America, patriotic than Brett Eldridge. Um, those of you who don't know him, he's a, a Warner music person, iconic country music singer. And he honestly got his start by being a great singer, but more importantly, just being an authentic person. So if you were to follow his Instagram page, it's kind of the opposite of Little Nas. And it's just... <laughs> him being this every, every man day-to-day -day guy. So we actually were introduced to Brett Eldridge. The quick story was um, our local GM in Peoria, Illinois, happened to go to church with his mom. And she was like, hey, this would be so cool if we put a billboard up of Brett Eldridge. And this was eight or nine years ago. So we did just that. It caught his attention. He thought it was pretty cool. We streamed live tweets where fans could interact. And that was kind of Warner Music and Brett Eldridge introduction to digital out of home. And fast forward to this past year where he launched his album, Good Day Movement. And what he wanted to do was, again, be an authentic and his Twitter follow and Instagram follow. It's just him, his dog, his mom, his daily travels. And he has a massive army of just everyday good people that are constantly supporting Brett. So in response to that, in the launch of the album, uh, he went on Good Morning America and a handful of morning shows to launch the album. And he sparked the out of home digital campaign 
by encouraging his fans and anyone to use the hashtag good day movement. And what we did at Lamar across the US is we had this templated digital sitting here and we were capturing real time Instagram photos, Twitter photos with the hashtag and streaming them live to the board. So you as a fan could provide a good day. And it was, uh, some of it was tear jerking. Some of it was fun. You know, we had some nurses that during the height of the pandemic that were saying, hey, we're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Um, a funny quick story behind it was obviously we have over 4,000 digital across the US. We actually had fans that would ping my team and say, hey, can you tell me exactly where this board is running? Because we ran it programmatically. Uh, I want to take a photo. And we had two fans, Anna, that drove four and a half hours oh, wow. to a specific board. And we felt so bad. We were like, you could have just called us and we would have put the board up behind you. Uh, but again, we talked about so social amplification. And so not only was it live streaming photos, but it was also photos from the fans taking of themselves on the billboard back out into the, uh, the social world. So it was kind of this, you're a part of the campaign and then now you're promoting the campaign back and forth. So this was by far my favorite campaign that we've done recently. I mean, that, that's incredibly powerful. Also mm -hmm. drove traffic. That's awesome. Um, Sam, uh, Sam, I think you have a good example as well. What is, what, what's the slide? Oh, it's the Bieber one. Right. So, uh, you know, much, much like what Jennifer was saying that, you know, artists are, are no stranger to brand deals. And in this case, Justin had created uh, his own brand partnership with his his designer um, who, who basically took his normal wardrobe, which is these long, long tees that he always had her custom make, like take the, the traditional Hanes shirt and, um, and make them custom for him. And Haynes liked it so much that his his the one that says ex Carla is Carla Welsh his his stylist so they just created their own line of Haynes t-shirts and he used out of home as the way to to announce the partnership and it was everywhere from like Times Square to Sunset but also uh, buses and transit and a bunch of non traditional formats as well. Also, also really cool. So all three of you have touched various projects with the same artist and you've each created impact or impact individually from respective sites of the businesses that you're in. So uh, one quick answer, but what's your favorite collab to date with a brand, uh, yours or somebody else's? Start with you, Jen. I love this Mariah Carey McDonald's partnership that just launched <clears throat> this week for many, many reasons. First of all, she's my guilty pleasure. I love Mary Carey so much and I always will. I don't care what anyone says, but honestly, you know, I've worked with McDonald's. We worked on the BTS collaboration. Um, they did obviously the Travis Scott, um, Jay Balvin, but this one is just so brilliant and so timely. And, you know, we all, every year at the label, we're like, can we get, even last year when we, when we launched Lil Nas X's holiday, the whole thing was like, how are we going to beat Mariah Carey for number one? Well, you know what? You can't. Mariah is always going to be number one. All I want for Christmas is you will be number one every year. Good on, good on you, Mariah. And so the fact that McDonald's leaned into this, they realized this and they created a special holiday meal with Mariah for Christmas is in my opinion, genius, obvious, genius, simple, works. Love it. Love it. Love it. How about you, Ian? Yeah, I'm going to bring my back a couple of years old school and it's non Lamar, but it's a uh, colossal media with uh, quest love and Red Bull music academy and what I loved about it is obviously we all love colossal and their beautiful life lifelike uh, imagery that they paint. But one of the artists was actually quest love that was helping to promote this and they did this random pop up while the artists were painting colossal as they were finishing up quest love. They set up a stage and Questlove performed and it literally became this like rush of people headed there. So uh, again, I love it because it's traditional, it's not digital. Um, and you had the artist that was promoting this great Red Bull Music Academy that helps a lot of young artists come to life. And here was an iconic person hanging out while they were painting a billboard. Uh, super, super cool. Um, Sam? The slide. Wait, see, see, there it is. So, uh, the Act I campaign with with Travis Scott was uh, certainly one that I was very proud of. Um, 
you know, we, we had started with a teaser campaign um, about nine months prior to him announcing that he was doing a beverage line with Anheuser-Busch, where we had the now famous cacti logo, but we had no representation of what it was for about nine months. So really starting to build, um, you know, a little bit of momentum for the brand, getting people questioning what it is. Um, and then after several months of having it appear on billboards around, around the country, we slowly started integrating uh, key elements of the art that would slowly let people know that there was some beverage product coming. Um, and then aligned with his announcement um, on TV, he ran some TV commercials and ads where he announced it at the Super Bowl. We then had full-fledged out-of-home complement it that let everyone know what it was. So for me, it was the idea that they utilized outdoor advertising before anything else to try to create some, some buzz um, and then it, you know, was heightened when uh, the other the other mediums were all included. So that was digital, online, um, and some TV. So, you know, it's it, you know it's 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 one for the playbooks, right? You know, you take a traditional company like Anheuser Busch, but then you put a superstar like Travis Scott with his own creative, uh, visionary mind, and then you know you get you get something very unique. Yeah. Yeah. All these examples are, I mean, very powerful. Uh, fans don't want to listen to us. They think they know better. They tie and, uh, you know, put things in front of the artists that make no sense. And the best partnerships we've ever done are the partners that, that they realize that you're partnering with us for a reason. You're coming to us to work with someone who, who can speak to Gen Z, who is deep in culture, right? Otherwise, that's why you're coming to us. You want a partnership that's going to be and it's going to move the needle for culture and for the Gen Z and millennial audience. And so if we tell you, and especially if our artist says to you, well, that idea maybe wouldn't be right. How about if we tweaked it and we did this, this, and this, and the brand and the partner, the partner will listen, that is the most valuable thing in any partnership. Um, I'll just shout out very quickly. I'm, I don't know if anyone from Taco Bell is listening, but they're the best partners I've ever worked with. They're incredible, they're flexible, they listen, they, they, want, to, they want to be in business with Lil Nas X and they're doing it in the right way. I hope they're listening. If, they, if they're not, we'll let them know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ian, Ian, how about you? You know, it's interesting because as we were prepping for this call, I don't think, you know, none of us had met Jen uh, before and you have a, a publisher, Lamar, you have a, a platform and a, a well-known for knowing musicians. And then you had Jennifer um, representing the actual brand collaboration. And as we were prepping for this call, it was like, this is the perfect collaboration here. It's having the brand, having the platform, the agency and the publisher truly collaborate. So my short answer would be true collaboration. So it gives you the ability to look at all angles, actually see the brief is there, if there is one. And to Jennifer's point, the flexibility to understand like, what is the media involved? And you know, the great work that Sam's done that it's like, well, out of home doesn't have to be in this rectangular box. It could be anything that exists. So I, this is in my, you know, utopia, every brand conversation should live like this uh, collaboration that we're literally having live right now. So I appreciate it. And how about you, Sam? Uh, to, 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 you know, the point of Jennifer and Ian, I think that, you know, specific to music, um, if you're going to work with an artist, you, you really lean on them for their creativity, you know, and you got to let that lead. I think, you know, in other verticals, you know, you, you might have other people that voice their opinion about, you know, what, what's the best strategy or the best look or, the best content or copy. But in my experience, when you work with the artist, even on the label side, the labels don't know what copy they're gonna run on the billboards till the artist delivers it, you know? And, and that's why it's really hard to buy for music um, because it, it's all done last minute. You can have the biggest album of the year, but the label won't get the, the final track list and, and the music delivered to maybe even like a few days before launch. Um, in Kanye's case, the day of launch. Um, and, and the art, like you don't even like the, the labels will tell me they got to book, book some out at home for an artist, but they have no copy, um, until like maybe the day before. 
which is why it's so important that we can offer them digital and, and static options. Um, but really it's like leaning on the artist for their creativity and their vision and what they want. So in the little Nas X um, example, it was finding a billboard where he could film his, his TikTok content uh, with the cacti one, it's being on Sunset Boulevard and being in the, in the, in the mix uh, with the most visibility. With Rihanna, it's, it's being in, in, in Soho, but doing it differently and doing a, a mirror, right? So all of this is like the brainchild of the talent and the artist and how they feel that they can connect with their, their followers uh, and their consumers ultimately the best way. And then it's on us to basically tr try to find the right format and medium to bring it to life. Yeah, so that that's again another very nice segue into to talking to something that I think is is quite central to the whole webinar and connecting connecting again with your audience. So, I want to talk a little bit about our medium as an amplifier and how you create great social inter integrations and maybe a little bit of a leading question and we've already touched on it, but I want to kind of just re-emphasize, you know, Jen again connecting with fans on social media is more important than ever, and that's really probably where the artist has has most of their contact directly with their fan base. Why are those social integrations so key? Uh, for a brand? For the artist. Oh, for the artist, because that's how they speak one on one with their fans. I mean, they are that's the beauty of what an artist can do to just, you know, stay on Lil Nas X topic. I mean, he everything he does is very to Sam's point before, even in relation to where the billboards are placed. Everything he does is very intentional. And what looked like, you know, our, our Montero album just fell out of the sky with all of the content and all of the lead up into it looked like it just happened. I mean, that was nine, 10 months in planning. I think he even posted one day, like, you can't take me down. I've been planning this for nine months. Hence why he had his whole pregnancy because it was a nine month process for, for the album to come out, his work of art, his baby to birth, you know, to birth his, his work of art. And so, you know, for somebody like Naz or any any other artist, they are they can speak one to one directly with their fans. They can message them. They can ask them questions. You know, artists. What's great about Instagram are the the quizzes that are sometimes artists can do. Like you know, and you know what else Naz did very very well. I'm sure other artists have as well. Is he teased and dropped little bits of music all along the way, like breadcrumbs leading up to the main release, so that by the time the album came out, a lot of his fans were already familiar with the content that he was putting out. And so, there, it's it's a communicate it's a communication funnel, I would say, and that that sort of sums up why it's so important. Yeah. So so that and and out of home is a good way to sort of get that communication started. Uh, and Sam, you you've done a lot of campaigns that have you know, aimed at doing just that. So what are the best and most effective uses of out of home that you've seen specifically for creating these social integrations? And what brands and artists do you think do it really well? Well, two, two things to follow up to what, what Jennifer was saying also is that before social media, you know, we, you know, artists really had to rely on press and the media and uh, like MTV and a bunch of other places to tell their story. And it was always manipulated through how they edited it or what they wanted to cover. But with social media, that the, the artists can say whatever they want. They can say it whenever they want. They can say it however they want. Um, and they've got a much larger fan base on social media than most networks have, right? So their reach goes way bigger. And, and I think when they buy the media, it also says what they want it to say, right? They, they can choose what, what to put on, on the outdoor. Um, and then that copy lives this fantastic content that's shareable on social media. In this case, we were in the height of the pandemic and Lady Gaga was um, <laughs> releasing new music and nobody was out, you know, and in, and in Southern California, there was uh, limited places that we can, we can go out of home. And one of it was being by the beach. Uh, so our beaches were really, really crowded at one point. Um, so Gaga decided to take her album to the people herself. So we um, basically did a wrap truck for her, uh, which she drove and put it all over her Instagram and basically let her fans know that she was coming. Um, and she went and just basically just delivered the music straight to the people where they were. So in this case, she took it to the Santa Monica Pier, to the beach, to Malibu. Um, and, and, and it just got picked up, you know, by, by all the media. So, you know, Vogue and Bazaar and Billboard and all the, you know, publications that typically would never cover outdoor advertising, like, like a Vogue or Bazaar, 
covered uh, covered Gaga taking it to the to the people, which which you know was was an incredible added value to everybody, um, and it did exactly what she needed it to do. Uh, and then I think there's the thirty seconds to Mars as well. I love this. I yeah. love this. I love this. I love this campaign so much. Um, so Jared Leto is a very polarizing character. He's not just a rock musician, but he's a model and he's also an actor. So he reaches so many different audiences in his professional career. And for his album, he had uh, essentially ran polls, uh, various polls uh, that basically talked about like the highest trending things online for different verticals. So, you know, biggest, biggest things people Googled were like, you know, God, sex, guns, alcohol, things like that, or top sex positions, which were like cowgirl, doggy face, 69, the crab, right? And he put that all over his album. Um, so what we did was we basically bought billboards <clears throat> all around um, LA and then put them on a double decker bus that was also branded. And he went on top of the double decker with a choir and he tweeted his fans every location he was gonna be at, which is essentially was where all the billboards were. And fans would meet him underneath each billboard and he would then perform tracks of his album for his fans and then have it all filmed for, for Instagram and Facebook. Um, so this was an integration of all social channels that he was on, so Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. He generated firsthand user content. He basically performed his album the day of uh, the album launch. And then the billboards and the, um, the bus and everything else got to live on for the remainder of the month to continue to promote the album. Um, and because people had seen it, anytime they identified it or they saw it out in, in the real world, they would post it and put it on their Instagram. And he did a fantastic job of reposting that fan content um, and Snapchat. I forgot about that one. Snapchat was was also utilized for this so it was pretty exciting i thought this was like a really really fun campaign it, yeah incredible and it just the, the creative like the idea how do you even come up with the idea i mean it's, it's fantastic um and i i think there's another example that's also really really good in my opinion biggest biggest out of home most successful out of home uh launch campaign for any album in history you know we've touched so many um amazing launches but nothing nothing uh reached the the level of uh drake's most recent uh campaign for certified lover boy um and 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 ian and i had worked on this one together uh along with you know another another dozen or so vendors um so everybody got to kind of touch this one but was what was so incredibly smart about this one was um, his approach, Drake's approach. So first and foremost, he did his out of home campaign three days before the announcement of the album, which most other artists typically wait till launch to buy their out of home. He did it beforehand to build the buzz and get the excitement going. So as Jennifer was talking about like the breadcrumbs, he was laying the breadcrumbs with this one. Um, no one knew who was going to be on the album. No one knew who the features were going to be on the album. No one knew the track list. No one knew anything. So what he did was he bought billboards in each of the cities where the artists that were featured on the album were from. And he used very cryptic messaging um, to basically announce who was going to be on the album. So in Times Squares in New York, uh, you know, he ran the one that says, hey, New York, the goat is on CLB. CLB short for Certified Lover Boy. Um, but no one had any idea who that was. I mean, the GOAT, people anticipated could have been Jay-Z, but it could have also been Nas. It could have been like any of the other greats from New York. Um, so it built up excitement and anticipation. And then the fans started retweeting this and it went viral on all the big music blogs and different artists and celebrities. But in the, in the case on the left from Memphis, you know, having a few artists that he actually announced who they were, those artists then posted on their Instagrams announcing to their fan base that they were going to be a featured on the album. So literally prior to the album launching on Friday at three days of uh, enormous buildup, not only from blogs, but the artists themselves that were featured. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, 
you'll see, no, sorry, backwards. Yeah, so right here, you'll see that, you know, Lil Wayne uh, and Travis Scott and a bunch of artists posted it, but then it became part of meme culture. And big brands like Fashion Nova made their own mock parody boards uh, that they edited. And then you even got Tom Brady in on the action um, where he posted his own billboard on, on his Instagram, um, you know, basically being a part of the conversation. So it really, really translated into, you know, meme culture, which was incredible. Yeah. And, and Ian, you work with Sam on this one, right? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. So it's, look, Sam's a, Sam's a good friend of mine personally. Um, I think we, Sam, we communicate more on Instagram, like just sending uh, posts <laughs> back and forth. So as, you know, not, not taking credit for this, but it's just kind of, him and I were collaborating, like, how cool would it be if this thing blew up bigger and we blew up Instagram uh, utilizing this? And it was kind of funny because we predicted some of these things that like, hey, I guarantee you there's going to be brands. And by far, you know, I love Lil Wayne because being a New Orleans native and um, Lil Wayne's my favorite. So that was my favorite post. But my favorite part of the entire campaign was what Sam and I kind of predicted may happen is Tom Brady putting up this he didn't even purchase this board, but it was kind of a fake post, you know, hey, Tampa, I'm not on CLB, which he's known for. So the the viral side of this outside of just artists, you know, um, Drake alone, Champagne Poppy on Instagram has over 96 million followers. And Anna, he took one photo of Times Square and it had an insane amount of retweets, likes, reposts and shares. And I think the total number, and it's tough to measure, but the total overall number of photos retweeted and shared beyond just the ones you're seeing here, Travis Scott and Lil Wayne and everyone else, it was something like over, you know, 1.8 billion retweets, reposts and share. And I think what I love most about this campaign was the collaboration that Sam and I had and the amount of different vendors and publishers that were involved. So it was the industry truly coming about together on a buy, but most importantly, the billboards is what drove the social chatter. And oftentimes it's the opposite side of it. And, you know, this was one of my, been with Lamar for 16 years, one of my favorite campaigns by far because the way that it was teased and most importantly that we didn't touch on, it wasn't about, hey, give me the best location in each market. It was give me the best hometown location where I can impact that community the most. Right. And it's not always necessarily right, Sam. It's not always the, the board in Times Square. It, you know, for Lil Wayne, it could be, you know, the lower ninth ward where he's from. And it's one of our lowest performing impression digital. Yep. But it played there because it had the biggest impact on people like myself that grew up in that neighborhood and in the city of New Orleans. So the, lo it, the location, the look, the location was more important than the impressions. And the content was even more important than that, right? Being able to reshare it. And another thing, Ian, that's really fascinating about this one too, is that the copy was so simple, yep. right? Like this was an overly complicated copy. You know what I mean? It was very, very direct. It was very simple. It was straight to the point, but it was genius in the sense that, um, you know, it was very specific to that market and, yeah, and that's teasing, why it worked. Yeah, just teasing the audience. And that, and that, I, that I think with this one, I, I agree, Sam. I think this is the, one of the best things that ever has been produced in a sense, right? I hope this one wins a, a, a lion. I definitely hope it wins an Obi, even though I cannot, of course, not <laughs> that at all. Uh, but, uh, but no, this is really a great example of all the great things that our medium can provide and how it connects to to it's other. All, it media. really is all and, the best you know, That premium is really depends on what campaign you're running, right? It's not about the strip or, or Times Square. It's about what what message you want to get across. So I, it's an amazing campaign. Um, but so with that, right? Also, right? also, also, let's not forget this. I think I think we have it in here, but also this was on the cover of at least fifteen different publications the next day. Oh yeah. I mean, this thing got <clears throat> this got covered in in over fifteen publications as a feature. So um, <clears throat> it really, really translated back into into the, the the world of online media as well. 
Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a real kind of poster child for for out of home. No no pun intended. Um, uh, we got to move on a little bit because I think we're we're uh, we're closing in cl closing in on time. There's so much still to cover. It's super engaging. Um, come back. We're, let's come back to to some of this. Uh, you know uh, the the kind of the thought of of out of home as the most Instagrammable medium, which of course I think is true. You know because it is visual. It's larger than life. It has you know great appeal. How do artists, you know, take full advantage of out of home in their launches? How should they think about it? How do they create campaigns like this? I think every, from an artist standpoint, I think they're all very, very unique and everybody takes their own personal approach. Um, certainly there's those that want like the big vanity boards, the high profile boards. But again, to, to my point earlier, there's a lot that just take it to the local level. Um, and I think because their fans perform differently, different artists look for different, different out of home uh, to reach those, those fans. So some of them will, will, will buy them in, in local small town tier two, tier three locations, because that's where their fan base really lives. And, it, and it's more relevant to them than a larger, larger market. But then you've got, you know, some high profile talent that their audience is a little bit more global and um, they need bigger statement pieces. So I think really it just, it truly comes down to the authenticity of the fan base and the, the artists need, you know, to, uh, and their desire of how they want to reach them. And the beauty I, uh, of home is like, there's so many different formats, yeah. airports, you know, transit, bus shelters, wild posters, um, you know, aerial banners, sky typing. I mean, there's so many things to choose from. So the artist really has to pick up a litter. Yeah, there's, and then, and then all the technology you now have at your hands. Um, so, so we, we have to move along. And, and, and with that, I want to talk about speed and fluidity and, and out of home. And we, we've already touched on that too, how important it is with speed, specifically for the music industry, as it's such a fast moving last minute uh, industry in many senses. Uh, and, you know, uh, to fulfill the artist's needs and desires, the label really needs uh, you know, to, to move fast and, and to, to juggle a lot of different deadlines. So how, how do you do it, uh, Jen? Well, I mean, I can talk about uh, releases and then I think Sam and E would have a lot to say about getting the information. Sam touched on it a little bit about how last minute we are. And I'd say, you know, it's definitely a, a, a real challenge in working with brands because brands plan out years two years. even if, you, if you're dealing with like beauty and fragrance, it's two years in advance and we don't know what's coming. And so it's very, very tricky. Um, an artist will work on something, you know, in the case of somebody like Kanye, as we've talked about, like, he'll, you don't know when he's done, he, when he's ready, he's ready. And even then he's not ready. You'll know. <laughs> yeah. And you won't know. And you just have to stand by and be prepared. Like, you know, we have an Adele launch. I think I mean, we, we knew that the single was coming. Like Adele's a good example because we knew it was in the, in the making, but we didn't know when we wanted it to drop. The single came out a couple of weeks ago. The album's coming out next week. But, you know, when the, when the artist is ready, the artist is ready. And we just need to, we're all in this business because we're here to support the arts. We're patron of the arts where, you know, we're sort of arbiters of, of the best way to get their music and their content and their art out there. And we just have to kind of be able to roll with it. So for example, you know, if an artist says I'm ready and I want to drop my album on, you know, January 5th, well, we just have to, you know, fall in line and work quickly and be fluid and flexible and nimble um, and figure out the best way to do it. And that's why, you know, obviously with the advent of social media, we can get a lot more done, obviously, than we ever could before. Um, but it's just about being really flexible and really nimble and kind of like being on standby for when the, for when the content is going to drop. And, and Ian, how can, how can we help from the media company side with that? Yeah, I think we've, the industry is beyond just music where we've understood this and we're learning it more. And I think COVID has fast tracked that. You and I have spoken at length about it. You know, you have a lot of ad agencies, you have a lot of new platforms or newer platforms like Milk Money and a handful of others that are creating the automation and allowing any brand, um, specifically the musicians, the ability to quickly interact and buy. Um, I know personally from our experience at Lamar Programmatic is we are now seeing a lot of these music houses coming to us, as I alluded to earlier, that are knowing that they can buy programmatically or they can buy on, on these platforms. So it's not this archaic like planning and building out. It's a, to your point, you know, Kanye and Lil Wayne are my two favorite artists. And 
it's their mentality. And when they're ready to go, you got platforms that allow them to interact and it, it makes Jennifer's job easier and it helps people like Sam and others that are out there. So I think the industry is there. I think on the publisher side, us exposing availability and inventory and rates in real time, that's something that we're all moving fast towards. And it only benefits, you know, folks like Jennifer and, and other brands that are out there. So I think we're, we're, we're there, but I definitely, if you're not there, understand the importance that you will not be bought. <clears throat> it's not available this quickly. No, oh. we need to be fast and nimble. Um, I want to, with that, you know, we're kind of moving into this sort of the tech, tech. Part I, have, of I, have, I have something I'd like to say real, real oh, yeah, quick, yeah. About how, the, how the publishers can help. So in our industry, it's like industry standard that Mondays are like the start of the campaign and, and, and the start of, you know, when, when things get booked, record releases come out on Fridays. So a lot of the, the labels don't want to book something on a Monday and have, you know, four days of dead space before that, you know, the, the, the album art can go live. So one of the things that, you know, I'm working with Ian and a couple other publishers on is the fact that, you know, being more flexible with start dates. Um, and then also the posting window in our, in our industry, you know, they have like this five day posting window grace period, uh, which also doesn't work for an artist, right? If they need their billboard out on a, on a Friday, for announcement and they want to use the billboard to announce the launch, it's very hard to be able to say, hey, it's going to take five, five business days and then it, it doesn't go up to like the following Wednesday, right? So I think the, the industry can get a little bit better about uh, posting quicker and guaranteeing posting dates. Um, in, the, in the meantime, digital has become our friend uh, and, and Ian and what he's done with his, his network uh, has been a saving grace for us because now we can actually guarantee that they'll be up on a Friday on digital assets. But, you know, there's there's more that we can do on the static side as well. Yeah. And I think also the knowledge that you have of how the industry works. Right. We need I think we need we need as we as we're becoming a, 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 a larger medium, you know, with a lot of assets that are now important. We need to just understand the, the customer's production cycle. And it's not just for the music industry. I mean, these are really valid things. And again, what you brought up there is, is important, Sam, and you have clearly you have a special connection to it right um but but tech you know is changing and and tech uh tech is the is is out of home's friend it really is uh you know if every tech change at all innovation kind of helps us get our message out better so how has tech changed out of home and how are the new technologies you know appealing to artists and brands and you you already showed some examples uh sam but uh you know what do you say and how are you thinking about this when you're working with your clients sure so from our perspective uh you know we wanted to give the the, the control and the transparency of the available inventory to the customers so really giving them the opportunity to uh view everything that vendors have available in one place and be able to pick and choose what assets make sense for them based on the location uh, or the demographic and then be able to add filters um, and that's something that we're really really excited about and we see is working so in the case of miley cyrus when i said she booked her campaign she booked it on her mobile phone using milk money's web app and she did it from her tour bus on her own uh from you know between city to city so mm -hmm. You know, if we were to lean on non non technology, and she'd have to look at a bunch of PDFs and spreadsheets and maps and try to like make sense of it, it'd be really difficult for her to do it. But if we streamline the inventory into a marketplace, and we have great partners like Lamar uh, and the things that Ian's doing, where they make their inventory accessible on the platform with with the run dates and the pricing, then any customer of any size and any experience can now buy our medium. And they can do it on their own uh, with some some key filters. You know, they can narrow down their audience and what's going to work for them. And I think that's the future for sure. Yeah, Ian, you really are a tech evangelist, an evangelist in many in many ways for out of home. And you're you're definitely the go-to for me about what what's latest and what's what's happening on that front. Can you talk a little bit to what's happening on the tech front and how it's improving out of home or changing things? Yeah, and I think, look, I, and I believe you may have told me this quote, and I don't know who it came from, but we're the only medium that technology has helped, helped, 
other mediums. Rashad Tabakawala. <laughs> yeah, Rashad Tabakawala, yeah, who's our buddy. Um, you know, obviously data, as I've mentioned over and over again, but you know, the reemergence of QR codes, uh, that, those are my favorite things is when you see bus shelters and you can tap and scan and download an album or watch a music video, but also the, the emergence of augmented reality and, and that side of things, I think that's massive. I think the, the biggest thing that's happening right now that I love is the NFTs, you know, the non uh, fungible tokens and the metaverse. And I believe we're beginning to play a lot in that world. And there's a lot of artists that are now doing concerts. I know you can now experience um, the different festivals. You can actually go to Burning Man in the metaverse, but there has to be a vehicle that drives that person to the album or to a teaser of, of an, an artist or to a festival. And I think that we're embracing that technology that way. And we're just at the infancy of it. And I think that allows people like Jennifer the ability to say when she's talking to her clients is, hey, this is no longer just a put your face or do a collaboration on a billboard. It be can become the portal per se in the metaverse that allows you to go deeper into that space. So I, I think it's just allowing technology to help advance our medium and it just being the infancy of where we are. I'll just add to that very quickly that we're about to do a project like that, Ian, with one of our very, very big artists, whereby there will be billboards that the artist is working on and there'll be QR codes that lead to an NFT. It'll be some point next year. So we're starting to really tap into that space. Yeah, so collaboration just happened right here, Anna. <laughs> For sure. No, and, and, and this whole webinar has been a testament to collaboration and how we can innovate. And, you know, again, that technology really, is, again, is out of home's friend. Uh, so we're, we're getting, we're closing in on the hour, uh, and I just want to kind of close up by asking each one of you to share your top advice, uh, to our audience members on how to creatively amplify every deal that they work with. What's the top secret to going even bigger and what, what, what are your learnings from this webinar here? Ian? I think, well, the biggest takeaway for me is at, on the fly is just the ability to collaborate, the ability to utilize technology innovation. And look, my, my motto over the 16 years at Lamar has always been like, no idea is a crazy idea. Understand technology as much as you can. You're an expert at the medium. Set up meetings, ask for the briefs, you know, ping people like Jennifer, or don't ping Jennifer, but ping different brands and, and go out and collaborate with ideas. Yeah, with great platforms. <clears throat> so, yeah, I've enjoyed this. Thank you, Ian. Sam, what do you say? A few words only. Uh, you know, to, to Ian's point as well, I think technology is our friend. I think, uh, you know, creativity leads. Um, and, I, and I think you should be adventurous, right? Like try different things and see what works. I mean, there's no, there's no guarantee that one campaign that worked for someone will work for the next brand. So just being authentic to your own brand and, and taking some big risks um, is my takeaway. Thanks, Sam. And Jan, what's your, what's your final, you get the final word. Oh, wow. I can drop, drop the mic for a real mic. Um, I kind of agree with everything Sam just said. It's just all about uh, being as creative as you can be, having an open mind, not being afraid to kind of bring up your ideas. And the best way to amplify is really to be very well versed. Like I, it's a tactical thing. I try to read as many things as I can almost every morning, like Business Insider ad week, Wall Street Journal, like just be very, very, very well versed in everything that's going on in your field and bring those ideas to the table when, when ideating. Thank you. Thank you all three of you so much. This webinar is probably one of the most fun I've ever done. And, and you know, you shared such incredible examples of out of home and, and you know, business you've done. So huge thank you for that. I hope everyone found it as, as inspirational as I did. Uh, so yeah. Jen, Ian, and Sam, I hope we can do this soon again. Uh, for those of you who were here and want to recommend to somebody else uh, or want to watch it again, this broadcast will be available in our webinar library shortly, and it will also be on YouTube. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone, wish you a great day and a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.